Hello, friend. In today's message, we address something that is so simple and so profound, anyone can get it, and yet so many people don't know it. It's just an easy thing to, to pass over and not realize. And so, hey, if you got a Bible or electronic device with a Bible on it, grab it and get ready. We're going to get into the Word together today. And listen, this truth, what we're going to share is so transformative, it can change your whole world. Hi, I'm Bayless Conlon. In life, we all face uncertainty. Whether it's financial troubles, relationship valleys, a health crisis, or just trying to discover your purpose, one thing is for certain, God sees you, He loves you, and no matter what you're facing, He has the answers. Well, I have a, a word to share with you from Isaiah 55. I would like you to please find that chapter, right? I have been loving this series we've been on out of the book of Isaiah, and I sort of landed on this chapter and just felt really strongly impressed that I needed to talk to you about it. In verse one, it says, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Yes, come buy wine and milk without money, without price. That first word, ho. Another version says, hey there. It's an exclamation to get someone's attention. Like, hey, I need your attention because what I'm about to say is really, really important. And the next word, he says, ho, everyone. What I'm about to say is for everyone. It's for everyone that's thirsty. And then he said, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. Now, to me, that actually sounds a lot like Jesus. In fact, he made reference to this verse as he said these words, and I read to you from John 7, verse 37, on that last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Well, Jesus has been glorified, and the Spirit has been given. So this, this verse is actually talking about coming to Jesus to experience the work of the Holy Spirit. And what he gives cannot be purchased, it cannot be earned, it is a gift. Come by wine, come by milk, without money and without price. And wine and milk are emblematic of blessing and, and abundance, but they also have a direct reference to the word of God. Consider this. Psalm 104 and verse 15, it says, wine makes heart, makes glad the heart of man. Psalm 19 and verse 8 says, the statutes of the Lord make glad the heart of man. Wine is a type of the word of God, and we certainly know milk is. The scripture says in 1 Peter 2 and 2, desire or, or come for the pure milk of the word of God that you can grow thereby. In 1 Corinthians as well as the book of Hebrews, milk is used as a metaphor for the word of God. So this is an invitation to come and have the Holy Spirit reveal the word to us. And notice the invitation in this one verse is given three times. Everyone who thirsts, come. You have no money, come. Yes, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Verse two, why do you spend your money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and your soul shall delight itself in abundance. This is food and drink for the soul. He's talking about spiritual food here, the Holy Spirit making the word of God real to our hearts. And then the first part of verse three, incline your ear and come to me. Hear and your soul shall live. I want you to think about what the Lord has done so far. He said, come, come, 
Come, listen carefully, incline your ear, come, hear, and your soul shall live because it has been nourished from the words that the Holy Spirit has spoken. In the second part of verse three, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, the sure mercies of David. Now, according to Acts 13 and verse 34, that has a direct reference to the, the victory that Christ won through his resurrection. In fact, the word, that, that same scripture is quoted there. So it's talking about the work of Christ. It's talking about salvation. In fact, the next two verses speak of Christ and the salvation that he brought to the world. I want you to follow me. This whole chapter deals with coming to him to receive the initial grace of salvation but it also applies to every facet of grace contained in salvation, be that forgiveness, healing, peace, strength, guidance, comfort, whatever it might be. When we come to verse six, it says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. Again, consider this. He says, come, listen, incline your ear, hear, seek when we come, we should expect the Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts and reveal the word to us, which brings salvation and then all of its benefits. But when we come to him, listening, inclining our ear, when we come thirsty because we want to hear this word, we also must, everybody say must, if we're going to experience the grace of salvation, all the benefits of salvation, we must as well as come thirsty and come listening, you know, and come willing to hear, we must also leave something outside. It's not negotiable. Verse seven, here it is. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. All right? He says, look, come. It's an invitation to his presence. The Holy Spirit is going to reveal the truth of salvation, but if you're going to receive it, if you're going to receive what, what Christ has come to provide, yeah, you have to be hungry, you have to be willing to hear, but you've got to be willing to abandon your ways of doing things and your thoughts because his thoughts, they're not our thoughts. His ways, they're not our ways. And notice he said, you know, abandon your ways and abandon your thoughts, and the Lord will have mercy. I'm going to make a statement you need to listen to. One wrong thought that is clung to, one wrong thought that a person refuses to abandon can keep the mercy of God from touching them. One wrong thought can keep God's mercy from touching us. What if a person has this thought, refuses to let go of it, and I've heard many people say this, that you have to earn your salvation. It cannot be as easy as just receiving and putting your trust in Christ. That's just too easy. No, it's, it's like there's this giant scale and on one side are my, all my good deeds and the other side all my bad deeds and at the end of my life, if my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds, then I get into heaven. So a lot of people believe something, you know, akin to that. But if you hang on to that thought, you can never receive the mercy of salvation. You'll never experience the grace, the free gift that Jesus comes to offer. That run, one wrong thought can keep you from it. In fact, Paul wrote about the Jewish people, his brethren. He said this was their very problem. Romans 10, verse 1, he says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. I said, that is not according to God's knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. You see, they had their own thoughts and their own way of going about it. 
They thought salvation came by works, by keeping the law, and because they wouldn't forsake their way and their thoughts, it separated them from the mercy of God's salvation. You can even be zealous about a thought, but just because you're zealous, that doesn't mean you're right. They were zealous about what they believed. See, wrong thinking leads to wrong believing that leads to wrong acting. Paul's basically saying, hey, you know, they had their own way, their own thoughts. They wouldn't abandon it. And my heart's desire is they, they'd be saved, but they've got to be willing to let go of that thought first and embrace God's thoughts. Verse 9 of Isaiah 55, the Lord says, for as the heaven is higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. So does that just leave us outside in the cold? No. Remember, the whole theme of this chapter is to come and to listen. And the Holy Spirit will speak to you. The Holy Spirit will give you God's thoughts. So he gives us an analogy of what will happen when we come thirsty and willing to listen and willing to let go of our way of thinking and our way of doing things. The Holy Spirit will give us God's thoughts and God's ways. He says in verse 10, for as the rain comes down, using a metaphor, as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven does not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. So shall my word be. It won't be void of power, but it will accomplish, and it will prosper in bringing salvation, healing, deliverance, restoration. It'll prosper in bringing strength and peace and guidance and comfort and favor and abundant supply and prosperity and protection. It will prosper in uprooting the bad and planting the good. Verse 12. For you shall go out with joy and be led out with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth into singing before you and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. All right, go out with joy from where? Be led out with peace from where? Well, think about what he said. He said, look, leave your thoughts, leave your ways outside and come to me. I have thoughts that are higher than your thoughts. I have ways that are higher than your ways. And if you will listen to me and embrace my word, you will go out from my presence with joy. You'll be led out of my presence with peace. So shall my word be, he says. You want to know what God thinks? This is a book of God's thoughts. You want to know what I think? Listen to me talk. My words are a revelation of my thoughts. God's word is a revelation of his thoughts. And the Holy Spirit will make God's thoughts real to us. And when we abandon our thoughts and embrace his thoughts, we go out with joy. We go out with peace. And the final verse there, verse 13, instead of the thorn, this is the result, instead of the thorn will come up the cypress tree, instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree, and it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. The, another version says it will be a, a permanent reminder of his goodness and power. Now, instead of the thorn, instead of the briar, thorns and briars are a type of the curse. They're a type of what's gone wrong. In the book of Genesis, when Adam sinned, God said, all right, now the earth is cursed for your sake, and it'll bring forth thorns and briars. The first thing that the curse did, when the devil gained entrance into the scene, you know, of humanity, the first sign was thorns and briars. But God says, now you've abandoned your way of thinking. You've abandoned your ways, and you've come listening to me. You've embraced my word, so instead of the curse, you're going to have the cypress and the myrtle, emblematic for stability and prosperity and safety and blessing. All right. I said everything to bring us to this point. I want to share with you four thoughts 
that you must forsake before you can embrace God's thoughts. Understanding that when you embrace his thoughts, it will put you on a pathway of fruitfulness, freedom, and breakthrough. All right, these are four thoughts you have to get rid of. Four thoughts you've got to leave outside before you can embrace his thoughts and his ways. Thought number one, that you are stuck. Stuck in your present circumstance, stuck in your present situation with no way out. I know there are some people here, you're just practically on the verge of giving up. Things are never going to change. I'm, su- I'm stuck. Saved, sanctified, and stuck. I'm stuck. Always been this way. It was this way for my family. It's this way for me. It's never going to change. I'm stuck. You got to be willing to get rid of that thought if you're going to embrace God's thoughts. And when you embrace his thoughts, my friend, his mercy can touch you. Somebody says, what's God's thought? Well, remember, this book is a revelation of his thoughts. Let me read it to you, 1 Corinthians 10 and 13. There is no trial, no trial has overtaken you that is not faced by others. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tried beyond what you're able to bear, but with the trial will also provide a way out so that you may be able to endure it. With the trial, everybody say with. With the trial, at the same time the trial is going on, God provides a way out. Turn around, tell your neighbor, just tell your neighbor, you have a way out. Yeah, there's a way out. There's a way out. There's a way out. You're not stuck. There's a way out. There's a way out. There is a way out. You know, I kept an article for many years a guy that was driving down this road, it goes between Klamath Falls, Oregon and Ashland, Oregon. I, I drove the, the road many, many times back in the, the 70s when I lived in the area. They've changed the name of it, but it used to be called Dead Indian Road. And I actually got stuck in the snow on Dead Indian Road one winter and was stuck for several hours, eventually got out. I, knew, I know every stretch of that road, drove every mile of it many, many times. And I, I was given an article about a guy and he had a little, driving a little camper and a, there was a snowfall and he got stuck on Dead Indian Road in his little camper. Couldn't go forward, couldn't go backward, too much snow. So he, he crawled into his, the back of his camper and he just stayed there. Now the road was closed for about a week And he stayed there. He was a Christian. And he actually kept a diary. And in the article I have, they they printed pages from his diary. He stayed in his little camper and said, I guess the Lord wants me here. I'm stuck. If it's the Lord's will, I will be rescued. He stayed in his little camper. And he starved to death. When the snow cleared, when there was a let up in the weather a week later, They found him dead in his camper with his diary. He died. I know the exact spot where his camper was stuck. He could have gotten out, followed the road down, walked down to where there was buildings and people. Would have taken him maybe four hours. But in his mind, he was stuck. He was stuck. So he curled up and he died. Because in his mind, he was stuck. I'm telling you, you're not stuck. You're not stuck. Some of you may remember me telling the story. We used to be on a little office building right down on the boulevard here. And we were so out of space everywhere. And the guy that owned the building next door was a, a precious brother in the Lord. He let us use one of the offices in his building for kids' church, um, you know, on Sunday morning. And he came to me one day and says, Bayless, you know, I have an underground parking garage 
And if you could get it past the city, if they, they'd sign off on it, I would give you my parking garage and you could have your church there. I think you could get a few hundred seats. And so I said, well, I'll check it out. So I, I go down there. It was pouring rain that day. I'll never forget it. And it was a low ceiling, but I walked it off. I figured it out. We could get 400 chairs in there. I thought, this is awesome because our, our you know, building next door only had 160 seats in it. And so I, I walk it all off. The, oh, this is great. And I go back to the door that, you know, goes up the stairs and it has locked on me. I'm locked in the underground parking garage. And I tried and tried to get it open and I couldn't. And so they had this gate with bars, you know, and the people got their little electronic thing. They'd push it and the gate would open. I went down there and I, I fiddled with that thing for about half an hour and I couldn't get it to open. So I'm stuck in the parking garage. I'm literally hanging onto the bars of this thing. And it, I'm, it's down low and I can see part of the street up there. And I'm down there for more than an hour. It might have been a couple hours. And I'm just waiting. Finally, a postman goes by. He's got his rain gear on and he's you know, pushing his thing. I go, hey. He looks down there. I said, I'm stuck in the garage. Would you go around and open the door? He says, yeah, I'll be there in a while. About 10 minutes later, he opens the door, lets me out. And so a few days later, I go to visit Jack. He was the owner of the building, the Christian guy. And I'm sitting in his office with Jack. I checked it out. You know, I, it may work. And I said, you know, a funny thing happened. He said, you know, the, the door shut behind me, and I got stuck in the parking garage. I was down there like an hour and a half, two hours. And he starts cracking up. I said, it's not that funny. He says, Bayless, it's hysterical. He said, you know, the... the the, the gate that goes across said, one of the bars is missing. You could have just walked right through it. I said, I said, you're lying. He said, no, no, go. And so I left his office, went downstairs. True. I'm holding on to two bars right here. The bar next to me, right where I was hanging on, right there. It's gone. The ga I don't even think I would have needed to turn sideways to get through it. But in my mind... I was stuck. I was stuck. So I couldn't see the way of escape that was right before me. And as long as you think you're stuck, as long as you say you're stuck, you will never recognize God's way of escape that is right in front of you. He will, with the trial, he will, with the trouble, make a way of escape. He has a pathway for you to walk, but you will never see it. As long as you keep thinking wrong, and talking wrong. Abandon your ways. Abandon your thoughts. God's ways and thoughts are higher. If you're going to embrace his thoughts and have his mercy touch you and guide you, you got to be willing to get rid of your thinking. All right, thought number two, that the enemy has the upper hand. Whether you're talking about your city, or maybe the school board, that has told you they don't want you to investigate what your child's being taught and you don't have a say, or, you know, maybe the local council or, or maybe, you know, our state. I listen to some people talk about what's going on in our state, and, you know, there's a mass exodus, obviously, out of California. People say, i got to get out of here. I feel like I'm living in a police state right now. And I vehemently disagree with things that, that our state government has implemented. Personally, I vehemently disagree with a number of things. But listen, the devil's not in charge of California. The devil does not have the upper hand. Some people think, oh, this, the world is going to hell in a hand basket. Look at the devil is doing this and the devil is doing that. And oh man, the, the world is just on fire. Listen, there, there's a lot of wrong things going on in the world, but the devil is not in charge. The devil does not have the upper hand. Not in my personal life, not in my marriage, not in this world. And I went to a church once. They sang this song and the words were basically, great big God, little bitty devil. And you know, that is the truth of the matter. I've read the end of the book, we win. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The Bible says, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, obviously we didn't finish this message. You're gonna have to join us next time. And listen, it just gets better and better 
and better. So you're not going to want to miss it. But, but for right now, as we're sitting here together with one another, if I could come into your home or into your kitchen, sit down at your kitchen table and share a cup of tea with you and talk to you, I'd tell you a few things. I'd tell you, number one, God loves you and that he'll not leave you, he'll not forsake you. You might say, but I've made some big mistakes. Well, we all have. Thank God for his forgiveness that is complete and that is total. God loves us. He, he loved us before we knew him, when we were enemies of God. He loves you still. He'll love you forever, my friend, and he's for you. And that's the second thing I tell you. He wants to help you. He, he has promises for you in his word. He sent his Holy Spirit to strengthen you, to sustain you, and to guide you. Put your trust in him. You're going to make it through. One person catches the vision. Others join in. The objective is huge. As others are included, using their gifts and influence, good progress can be made together. In the church, there is only steady and lasting progress as each generation builds up, supports, and encourages the next. In his book, From Generation to Generation, Bayless Conley outlines the role, responsibility, and opportunity each generation has to connect and build God's church together. Glean from Bayless's experience and practical advice. Use the information on the screen now to order your copy of From Generation to Generation.